A very warm welcome to you all to the 2012 President's Invitation Lecture. It's uh, very pleasing to see that uh, once again we have a full house uh, despite the inclement weather. Um, this, I am quite sure, is a, is a tribute to our speaker this evening. Um, and a recognition, I think, of the importance uh, to the maritime industry um, of the industry that uh, he represents. As many of you will be aware, it's the tradition uh, that the speaker for the President's Invitation Lecture comes from beyond uh, the UK shores, uh, a mark of the importance that the Royal Institution of Naval Architects places on its role as an international professional institution. And also that each year a different sector of the maritime industry is represented by that speaker. Uh, this year is no exception to that tradition since our speaker is from Brazil and is a senior member of a leading company in the offshore industry. Uh, but before I introduce him, I would just like to take a moment uh, to thank ABS uh, most sincerely for their continuing support of the President's Invitation Lecture. The institution is very grateful to them for their generous support of this and other institution activities. Now I'm sure that our speaker's company will be very familiar to many of you here tonight. Eduardo Utran is the executive manager of supply and logistics at Petrobras, one of the world's leading companies in the offshore sector. It has upwards of 100 production platforms, 15 refineries, 30,000 kilometers of pipelines, and more than 6,000 service stations. It is a company at the forefront of developing technology to explore and produce oil in deep and ultra-deep water. Eduardo graduated in electronic engineering. He holds a master's degree in computer science and an MBA in administration. He joined Petrobras in 1990 in its IT department. In 1996, he moved to the International Trading Department where he started as a trader and was assigned to different management positions and overseas postings. In 2002, he set up the trading operations of Petrobras in Southeast Asia, where he remained until 2007 as managing director. In 2008, he was appointed as downstream shipping general manager, and since 2010, he has been assigned as downstream logistics executive manager. He is currently responsible for crude oil and products logistics, including shipping, ports, terminals, pipelines, railways and trucks, and logistics infrastructure. Quite a responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the title of Eduardo's presentation is Petrobras Challenges and a Focus on Its Shipping Needs. I'm sure it'd be no surprise to you to learn that in order to meet its goals in terms of crude oil production, refining capacity, and supply to the Brazilian market, Petrobras has the single largest investment plan worldwide. The shipping industry plays a major role in achieving those objectives, since most of the growth in crude production is offshore, and Brazil is a continental country with a very long coastline. In his presentation this evening, Eduardo will address Petrobras's targets and will provide an outlook on its shipping strategies. I'm sure there can be no better qualified person to describe how Petrobras is meeting the challenges which it faces. And it is my great pleasure to invite Eduardo Otran to give the 2012 President's Invitation Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, first of all, I'd like uh, to say that I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and I was very pleased when I got this invitation from my friends in ABS to be here tonight to, to present you this uh, small presentation about Petrobras uh, targets and, and the goals we want to achieve. It's always very exciting for us you know, to talk about Petrobras. Um, what I, I hope to achieve by the end of this presentation is to give a an overview of uh, what Petrobras is today and what Petrobras intends to be in maybe 10 years' time. And, and, uh, and the goals are very, very high. 
and it's very challenging for us as, as executives in that company. Um, I was uh, giving an introduction of my role at Petrobras, so you are uh, aware that uh, my role covers all downstream logistics, which basically covers all the movements of crude oil and products in Brazil, not only on the maritime side, but also on pipelines and, uh, and terminals. And you also take care of the infrastructure that will be talked a little bit here as well that will be needed, you know, to, to face the, the growth of the company. Um, I have to make a disclaimer here, you know, uh, according to stock market regulators. So if you decide to make any investment, it's at your own, own risk. <laughs> I'm just providing you the best information I have so far, you know. Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to, to place uh, a Petrobras it's, it, in its environment, you know. Petrobras supplies the Brazilian market. The Brazilian market is the seventh largest market in the world as of today. It's a continental country with 200 million people, and it's growing fast. It's growing fast, you know. Uh, we, uh, we see that uh, something's happening in Brazil, which I don't think we see in other countries, which is the oil demand grows quicker than GDP in Brazil. So if we have, a, let's say this year, you're gonna have a, a GDP growth in Brazil around 1.5%, which is quite low for emerging country economy. But on the oil demand, we'll be achieving five to 6%. So this is, this is a big issue for us to handle. Um, this is uh, the outlook for, for demand in Brazil. We are now currently at 2.3 million barrels a day demand. We have two scenarios, but let's say by 2020, we're gonna have 3.2 to 3.4 million barrels a day demand in Brazil. And this is basically driven by middle distillate, you know, uh, for transportation needs, and of course, because Brazil is, is very important, the commodity is trading, you know, so we need a lot of uh, uh, transportation fuels to move that production to our ports and export. We are, we are pretty much integrated. We are in, as Petrobras, we are in upstream, we are in downstream, gas and power, and we also have some international assets. Through our subsidiaries, we are in distribution where we have 40% of the market. We are in transportation through our subsidiary Transpetro, which owns 56 vessels and manages all, all our maritime terminals, our inland terminals and our pipelines. And we are in biofuels as well. We are the biggest uh, producer of biofuels in Brazil. We have three plants, and we are also the third largest ethanol producer in Brazil. So it's very important uh, to be in that market, not, not only because it's, uh, it's a renew renewables uh, fuels, but also because gasoline in Brazil, I think is the only place where gasoline is blended with, with ethanol. So ethanol is like a natural competitor to our gasoline. Uh, on the upstream side, we are currently producing uh, 2.4 million barrels of oil equivalent. And we have, as, uh, as I said here, uh, lots of production units o o offshore, you know, um, and lots of projects they're gonna see further down. Uh, in Brazil, we have 12 refineries with a capacity of 2 million barrels a day. And we hold now 98% 90, 98 of the Brazilian market. Uh, a few years back, when prices in Brazil were slightly better, you know, that share was around 94%, but now it's around 98%. So gas in power, we have participation in most of the gas plants in Brazil and a capacity of 5.8 megawatts of generation. We are present in 28 countries and mostly in uh, upstream. We also have uh, one refinery in the States, one refinery in Japan, and a company in Argentina which has refineries as well. Well, when I, uh, if I compare Petrobras with uh, its listed peers, you know, companies which are also listed, we see that Petrobras is placed, you know, between fourth and fifth, you know. And as we go through the presentation, you probably see that our goal is to move that position, you know, in 10 years' time, maybe to first, second, or mostly third, you know. I'm not talking about market cap because you never know about you know, the market capitalization, what, what's going on in the prices of shares. Um, this year we had a change in our management team at Petrobras as we may, may be aware, you know. We have a new CEO, a lady, 
and she has been with the company for over 30 years, and she was in the former executive board. And besides her, our chief financial officer was in the former executive board as well. And, but all the other chief officers were, were replaced, you know, and they're all very experienced people coming from um, upstream, coming from uh, engineering, coming from downstream. And the very first thing that the management team did was to try to set realistic targets for Petrobras. You know, Petrobras in the last year was, was not complying with the forecast it was doing for its uh, crude oil production and other targets that it was setting for the company. So we, we tried to, you know, be more realistic in terms of our goals, you know, and we are very confident now that we'll be able to achieve those goals. So in terms of our crude oil production, we are currently producing two million barrels of oil in Brazil, and we hope to be producing 4.2 million barrels of oil by 2020. And you, you see from the graph that uh, the production remains about the same until 2013, 2014, and that's when we start having the growth which comes more rapidly, and we're gonna see why very soon. Uh, we decided to keep our investment plan at the same value we had before, at 236.5 billion US dollars, and you're gonna see that basically it's mostly on upstream, and secondly, in downstream. On upstream, most of the investment of 131 billion goes to production development. It means that the reserves are there, the oil is found, we know the oil is there, the only thing we have to do is basically produce that oil. We are also investing 20% of that amount in exploration. We need to increase our reserves, find more oil. And also infrastructure and support is, is a big issue because uh, most of our production is basically overseas. And with the pre-salt fields, we're talking about deep water, ultra deep water. We're talking about production units that will be located 300 kilometers from the coast. So logistics to, for that uh, production units is something that is very, very challenging. Petrobras has had to develop you know, new ways to, to provide support for those uh, production units, those sites. On the downstream, we have to increase our refining capacity. And that's, it's, it's simple, you know, the market's growing, as I, as I mentioned before. We're talking about a 50% growth in demand. So we need to grow our uh, refining capacity in Brazil. Uh, besides that, we are investing in operation improvement, quality, because um, quality specifications in Brazil are quite restrictive, we have maybe some of the most restrictive uh, specification for products. And here we have logistics, you know. Logistics is also very important, not only to be able to deliver products in the market or have my oil go into my refineries or the new refiners, the new refineries, but also to be able to export oil out of Brazil. Most of our new production units are using uh, spread moving systems which require dynamic positioning vessels to take this oil from those production units. Those vessels are very specialized and they're much more expensive than conventional vessels. Then I need a way to transship this oil from dynamic positional vessels to conventional vessels. So we have to build this infrastructure. We have to be either in the sea or through building new ports in Brazil. So in terms of uh, our fleet expansion, we are investing $3 billion to build vessels in Brazil. Those are vessels that will be built by a subsidiary, Transpetro. We have already taken delivery of some of them. I will, I will cite them later. And also uh, an investment of five billion US dollars on logistics, you know, to be able to either export or use our oil into Brazil. Um, giving a focus now on our maritime activities, I will cover first, you know, what we need on the upstream side. And, and the numbers here are really impressive. Uh, this is how we plan to achieve our 4.2 million barrels a day uh, production by 2020. So you see that uh, we have uh, already in place uh, those two FPSOs that we're planning for 2012. I guess uh, Baúna in Piracaba has been, there was a small accident in Singapore, so she'll be delayed a bit. 
but from 2013 onwards, you know, we're gonna be placing, you know, five new FPSOs, and then goes to 2014. And then in 2016, again, we have a, we have a huge challenge to put all those units um, up and running. And that's we're gonna really boost our uh, crude oil production. Um, I placed a small Brazilian flag here to, to call your attention for the local content policy of Petrobras. It, it's really something that Petrobras is taking very, very seriously. Uh, not only because it's a requirement for a regulator agency in Brazil or a government policy, but we do feel that it's very important for us to have a very strong industry in Brazil that can fulfill our needs and respond quickly to the needs that Petrobras may have. So putting all those uh, things together, we do need to have a strong industry across the oil chain. You know, it goes from the maritime activities, but also suppliers, you know, uh, people, management, you know, every, every kind of supplier. So out of those uh, new production units that will come up in the period 2012-2014, Three of them will be built in Brazil. Um, from 2015 onwards, we'll try to build as much as we can in Brazil. We have eight units, which will have the same design. They'll be all dedicated for the pre-salt fields, same capacity. And those replicants will be used in sites that Petrobras has a partnership with other producers. We have also four VLCCs in conversion, which are done in Iauma shipyard. Yauma shipyard used to be a site where Ishikawajima shipyard was in the 80s, you know, and Petrobras now took over, and we are starting the conversion with those four VLCCs. In terms of drilling rigs, I was just talking to someone here involved in that uh, business, you know. Uh, we received uh, up to 41 drilling rigs. Up to 2013, we have 41 drilling rigs operating in Brazil, all built overseas. And from 2016 onwards, the plan is to have basically drilling rigs built in Brazil and, and delivered to us. And, and this is the, the time frame of those constructions. Petrobras set up uh, a company called SETI Brazil, where Petrobras has a 5% stake. The other equity belongs to banks, uh, pension funds, other investors. And SET Brazil manages then other companies which are actually having the contract with the shipyards in Brazil to build those drilling rigs. So altogether, SET Brazil holds 28 contracts. Seven have been finalized and they'll be built in Atlantico Sul shipyard in the northeast of Brazil. 21 are uh, still under discussion. And the other five uh, we are still discussing with the ocean rig to build them in Brazil as well. On the supply vessel boats and uh, support vessel boats, as I don't have the data of uh, 2011, but by 2010, we had already 287 vessels operating in Brazil, and the plan still remained to have 568 vessels by 2020, and we will try to beat as much as we can in Brazil as well. Well, moving from the upstream to the downstream side now, where I feel much more comfortable. Um, I'd like to show you that uh, with, the, with the growth in the market that we have been experiencing, not recently, but since 2005, our cargo movements now grew a lot in the period 2005 to 2011, and especially on the import side, because the market was growing and our refining capacity was not growing at the same pace. So we, on the import side, we had a growth of 6%, 6 to 7%. We also grew on exports because of the growth of uh, crude oil production. And we also grew in our cabotage movement to supply our market. When I, when I look at the number of calls at Brazilian ports and overseas ports, of course, we see, we see the, same kind, the same kind of growth. And basically, to support that growth, you know, our fleet grew as well. You know? So if I take the 2005 base, we are we are operating around 116 vessels on a daily basis. And as of today, we are operating around 250 vessels, you know. And that fleet grew uh, 
by, with vessels operated by Transpetro, which are subsidiary, vessels operated by third parties, ship owners, and spot, spot uh, voyages as well. It's, it's important to, I think, to mention here how, how we operate. As, as logistics, what we do, we take all our vessels on time charter basis or on a spot basis. Even the ones that belong to Transpetro, they are chartered to Petrobras. So basically the vessels we manage are vessels run by Transpetro and by third, third owners as well. So what, what we've been, you know, in the last years, uh, defining as a strategies to, to have, to manage that fleet, you know. One of them is to renew Transpetro's fleet. You know, the fleet's getting old, so we have, a, we have a program to build vessels in Brazil where actually Transpetro is the contractor of those, uh, those uh, construction contracts with the shipyards. We also have a plan to give incentive to Brazilian shipping companies or even overseas companies that want to come to Brazil and we, we are in giving incentive to them through long-term contracts to build in Brazil and operate those vessels on the Brazilian flag for Petrobras. And of course, you know, because of our needs is still quite, quite significantly, you know, we still be chartering vessels from, you know, third part owners. owners. So our, our profile of the fleet as of today is in terms of 30 part vessels, we have 28 dynamic position on vessels, which basically are used to lift our crude oil production for our units and take them to our terminals or transship oil for exports. 90 conventional vessels and 11 LPG carriers. Transpetro is currently running a fleet of uh, 44 conventional vessels and 12 dynamic positional vessels. In terms of, uh, in terms of the program that Transpetro has in Brazil to build vessels in Brazil, this is the, the overall program. It complies of 49 vessels to be built in Brazil. Out of them, we have already received two MRs and one conventional Swiss Max. Uh, the second conventional Swiss Max is going to see trials this month and we'll probably be receiving her early next year. And they, in 2013, we'll probably be getting another four to six vessels off this program. Uh, we have had delays. Uh, there is a learning curve here. You now Transperto is learning the hard way that we are starting again uh, an industry in Brazil, uh, we, we lack uh, resources, uh, we lack uh, management, we lack expertise, but I think the program now is moving and, and I guess the learning curve will be quite quick. In terms of uh, the program where Petrobras is giving incentive to other companies to set up operations in Brazil or to increase operations that they already have in Brazil, we've granted uh, 39 contracts of 15 years uh, time charters to Brazilian companies or overseas companies that wanted to, to build in Brazil and deliver vessels to, to Petrobras. Um, one of the incentives uh, besides what Petrobras is doing is the availability of finance in Brazil, which is done through the Marine Merchant Fund at very uh, low interest rates, of course, depending on the financial guarantees of the ship owner. Um, I would say that uh, out of those 39 countries, we are very positive that we're gonna get delivery of uh, more than 20. You know, some of the companies have already uh, set up the contracts with shipyards, you know, finances in place. Uh, we, may, we may have some, some delays in the delivery times, but that's not a big issue for Petrobras because we don't see uh, tankers as a critical resource in the industry as of today. So there is enough liquidity in the market. If those vessels are not ready, we'll be taking vessels from the market and we will give time to those companies to, to build you know, and set up operations in Brazil. So we're just about to decide what to do with some of those vessels that we know already won't be built. So either we go back to the market for another round or if we renegotiate time of delivery or something like that. We haven't decided yet. So to give you now an idea of uh, what, what's, what's the, the current infrastructure in Brazil to support all this growth, you know, we have already 47 shipyards up and running in Brazil. 
I'll, I'll give an overview where they are located ju just in a second. 11 new yards under construction, 62,000 people already working in, in those yards, and uh, a 7 million dead weight order book. And of course, you know, all the, the oil platforms and the deep water drilling rigs that will be uh, built in, in those facilities. The challenges are, you know, how to develop human resources and Besides human resources, uh, the knowledge of project management is very important. That's one of the things that we realize, you know, to, to have a proper management of the whole project, it is very important, you know. We need to increase productivity in order to lower costs, you know. And again, local content is something really, really important that we want to increase more and more. This is uh, the location of the, of the shipyards in Brazil. Uh, we have new, new shipyards in the, in the north part of Brazil here. This is the Estaleiro Atlântico Sul, which can build uh, the Swiss Maxis and can build uh, FPSOs and rigs. Promar is a new shipyard. It's going to be building LPG carriers for Petrobras. We have uh, quite a few number of shipyards in Brazil, which are small to medium shipyards. There's a, a big one called uh, from OSX, which has the capability of being FPSO rigs and um, uh, big tankers as well. And in the south of Brazil, we also have uh, the Rio Grande shipyard, which has the capability to build uh, big vessels or, or drilling rigs. So this is the, the order book uh, as of today, and what we expected to be new orders for, for those shipyards, I won't, I won't go through them, but the numbers are quite expressive, you know. And, uh, well, I think that's uh, basically what I wanted to share with you. And I'll just leave here some uh, 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 final messages, which I think it's, it's the key things that I wanted to address. First is that Petrobras will double its crude oil production. Petrobras will double its oil reserves will increase our refining capacity about 70%. Our market will increase around 50%. And we will seek more and more for higher local content. So in that sense, I think you play a very, very important role to help Petrobras to achieve those goals here. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you. So if there's any questions, be more than happy to answer. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Eduardo, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's had us all drooling, really, the, uh, <laughs> the quantity of work there, the opportunities. Yeah. Um, can I ask um, for questions from the audience? Yeah, when we first started the, the program, we, we set uh, uh, a few requirements uh, for the companies to be entitled to participate in, in, in the tender. Um, one of them was to have some experience in shipbuilding, and the other one is to basically have experience in, in running vessels, operating vessels. So it was... Uh, not very restrictive in that sense, you know, but you know, if if the company was going to to bid for LPG carrier, it had to have an experience of building LPG carriers. So basically, it was based on on experience, you know. We also would allow um, associations, you know, if a Brazilian shipping company wanted to associate itself with someone else who had that experience, that would be we would accept that, you know. As, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we see the tanker market as very liquid today. So really, Petrobras is, is willing to give incentives to construction in Brazil, and we won't be putting too much of a constraint you know, in order to achieve that. Any? Uh, 
Perhaps whilst other people are thinking about it, can I ask a question, Joanna? Yeah. You mentioned um, on a couple of occasions um, the desire to uh, increase the, the local content um, within each of the contracts. Do, do you, do you um, prescribe a certain minimum content um, for each of your contracts, or is it different for each contract? Yeah. On, on the upstream side, we, we have a, a regulation to follow. Okay, this is uh, set by the petroleum agency regulator, and they set uh, local contents for different equipment at different levels. You know, so sometimes they can they can set a level at seven percent, but that can go as high as sixty three percent or sixty five percent. So on the upstream side, we we do have regulations we have to comply with, and we have to I mean suppliers then have to to show to the agency you know if they achieved that uh, local content or not. On the downstream side, we don't have that as an obligation, but we do the same kind of work internally, okay? So every time we're gonna build something on the downstream side, we make a full study of what's possible to be, uh, to be uh, sourced in Brazil, uh, what kind of services can be sourced in Brazil as well, to set what will be the level uh, of local content. Mm, uh, thank you. And I, I, it's, it's becoming stricter and stricter. <laughs> Um, question from uh, Professor Robel. Paul Robel, University College London. What's your approach to the uh, challenges of the climate change agenda? Climate change? Climate change and, and the CO2 emissions and all that stuff. Is that something that uh, worries you? Do you have a, a specific response to that? Uh, yeah, we, we have, uh, we have uh, corporate initiatives in, in that sense, and especially on the fuel efficiency. You know, for instance, in terms of our, I mean, of course, again, we have to comply. On the upstream, it's very strict, of course, you know, uh, and we have to comply with CO2 emissions and things like that. We have to decide what to do with CO2, either to re-inject it or which way we're going to do that. So the, on, on the upstream side, there is, again, you know, uh, requirements that we have to fulfill from our petrol agency. On the downstream side, we also have that very uh, in place for refineries. And emissions, you know, in certain areas, we are, we are achieving our limits of emissions, especially in the big cities, you know. It's not mu uh, much of a concern in the inland areas or outskirts of the big cities, you know. And on the, on the shipping side, okay, we have programs, you know, to try to move into more efficient uh, engines, you know, that, that, uh, that have less emissions, yeah. There's a question here. And another one at the back. Thank you. Yeah, I was amazed by the number of uh, new shipyards uh, being developed in, in Brazil. And um, I'm just asking if these shipyards are, are already ready to build, let's say, Suez Max tankers uh, in time and with the required quality, or should owners still rely on more traditional and older shipyards like Mawa or Asia? Okay, uh, Swiss Max uh, tankers can be built as of today only in Atlantic Sul. It's the only shipyard in place that can build them. OSX will have that capability in terms of size, but we haven't seen any contracts so far. I don't think that has any other shipyard that will be able to build a, a vessel with that size. If we, we go to a smaller vessel like the Aframax, then we, we start to have more uh, places to build those vessels. If you go even smaller to MRs, which are the vessels that we need more, we have quite a few options in Brazil. And I would say uh, shipyards like ESA, Mauá, or Atlantico Sul are really capable of building those vessels as of now. We have received uh, already, as I mentioned, two MRs from the Mauá shipyard. There are two more to come, and those vessels have been operating with us for almost a year now, and uh, the quality is, is, is very good, no complaints at all. Yeah. There was a question at the back there. <coughs> Sorry. Alan Stokes, I changed the subject to talk about the offshore upstream side. Uh, you mentioned in your talk the same issue that we're having in the UK of a lack of resources. I wonder, do you, what initiatives are you taking to reduce the number of men offshore 
and you possibly see a day when some of your FPSOs and compliant platforms could be unmanned uh, in waters off Brazil. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if we will ever have a platform that will be a man, but definitely the number of people in this platform is, is getting less and less through automation. If we compare the older units we, we have in campus base with the new ones that are put in place, we need much less people. Uh, so this is one of the things that will require less people. Um, the other thing is to train people to be working on those uh, units. There's a lot, lot, some work being done with Petrobras and the government, with the Navy, to try to train more people. But I guess the, the, the major issue in Brazil now is not actually to train people, it's to retain people. Because you know, the economy is growing so fast in Brazil that lots of competition within the country with the offshore industry and the tanking industry, with those people which, has, which for the Brazilian students are highly qualified to work in other areas. You know? So that's, I would say retaining in Brazil is, is, is the big issue you now. So, question. Uh, Dave Wilton with Aviva. Very interesting to see the expansion both upstream and downstream. And the downstream expansion is, I guess, almost unique globally. There's so much new investment going into refining. Do you see an opportunity to export that new refining technology to other parts of the world? Well, I'm very, I'll be very, very honest in that answer, you know. We are we're struggling a lot to, to develop this new refining capacity. We have, uh, we have four projects in Brazil, okay? One is a refining build, being built in uh, Pernambuco with a 225,000 barrels a day capacity, which is not very big for current standards. And this refinery has a, a, a particularity because this one was supposed to be a partnership with the PDVSA. So actually, they're building two refineries, one for Venezuelan crude and the other one for Brazilian crude. You know? So in that sense, you know, cost is not you know, at the international levels. You know? The other refinery is being built in Brazil, in, in, sorry, in Rio de Janeiro, which at first the project was a petrochemical plant and that turned it into a refinery, so it's a small one again. So those projects are not at international levels. You know. What we're planning to do and we're changing, you know, the way we are managing those projects is for the new refineries in the northeast of Brazil, that you're gonna be building you know, in 300,000 barrels a day trains. You know. And this is really, we're gonna, we are doing that through design competition using international standards. So we do hope to lower the cost of construction in Brazil in those refineries. And one of the things that I may say here is that we are looking for partners, you know, either refiners or some people willing to invest in refining Brazil. I mean, the, the discussion is open on this matter. Thank you. I think there was another question at the back there. Mark Charman from Fastroom Group. Um, it's widely read about, and we all know about the skill shortages that the industry faces globally. Uh, for the people that you need to uh, to meet your projects. Is it likely going forward that uh, you'll reduce the requirement for local content in human resources? Um, I, as of now, I would say no. We, we are very uh, determined to, to seek 100% you know, to achieve our goals in terms of local content. And uh, if we achieve 95% or 90%, it's going to be a great achievement. But this is something that we really take, uh, not only because our major shareholder wants that as a government policy, but we, we do feel that it's very important to support the growth of, that Petrobras wants to have in the future. So as, 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 as hard as we will try very, very hard to achieve this local content. Yeah. Thank you, are there, are there any more questions? It's a bit of a macroeconomic uh, question. You mentioned about the GDP increase is 1.5%, while the oil demand is, is around 4 and 5%. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I was able to explain that in 2009. 
because we had, <laughs> we had the crisis, you know, the base in 2009 was much lower because the financial crisis then growth was high in 2010. That was the explanation in 2010. Then it came 2011, and we saw the same phenomena. You know, GDP in 2011 was I mean, quite high in Brazil, was uh, around, you know, 7%. But oil demand growth was around 14%, which was really, really high. So we thought, okay, it's an emerging, you know, economy recovering, you know, we're doing 7%. But then it came this year where, I mean, the world is somehow in a crisis, you know, we see crises everywhere and uh, the outlook's not very good. Brazil growth is, is, is low, you know, 1.5%. We started the year thinking about 4.5, but still, you know, demand is high. So why we think is that, you know? First of all, there is a, a, an increase in the power of purchase of population in Brazil. We're talking about 200 million people and maybe 20 million people now have access, you know, for instance, to airplanes. Air tickets, they're able to buy air tickets, you know, instead of uh, traveling by bus. So that uh, explains the demand on the jet fuel. You know? The other thing is commodities. We're actually expanding our commodity base uh, in terms of uh, grains, you know, and uh, agricultural production. Could explain a little bit on the transportation fuels. We are also actually developing a, a, an industry also to, to, to supply more goods for this population, which is coming with more power of purchase. And then on the retail side, there's also lots of movements, you know. So we see uh, on the transportation fields and jet fuel, those will be the explanations. And of course, you know, as I mentioned before, prices in Brazil are not falling uh, international prices, you know, for the time being. And gasoline is quite attractive, you know, so people are buying more cars and also, because the government is providing some incentives for the auto industry, which you know provides jobs in Brazil. So there are a few explanations in there, which explain why you're increasing the demand in gasoline, uh, uh, middle dieselers, and jet fuel. Are there any more questions? Right. In that case, um, before we um, uh, retire for uh, uh, dinner, can I um, invite uh, Cassie Ticker, who is the Vice President of ABS Europe, uh, to say a few words? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Eduardo Autran uh, for this very informative and interesting lecture. It's very nice to hear words like uh, growth, increase, <laughs> demand, <laughs> especially being in, yeah. in Europe. So thank you very much for that. And as a sign of appreciation from ABS, um, we'd like to present you the um, ABS Eagle. And uh, we, um, we're very appreciative of being a small part of the uh, the growth increase in demand in, in, in Brazil as well. So thank you very much. I, I would also like to um, uh, thank uh, Peter Friends, president of RENA, uh, for giving this opportunity um, as the uh, annual president's lecture for RENA. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. And of course, Trevor Blakely for the excellent organization, which I'm sure will continue with the dinner <laughs> afterwards. Thank you very much. Yeah.